HVAC 360, episode number two, Ashray and HR Expo 2010 from Orlando, Florida. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of HVAC 360. I'm your host, Matt Nelson. On this edition, I'd just like to talk a little bit about uh, one of the uh, keynote speakers that I saw at, uh, or the keynote speaker, I should say, I saw at the ASHRAE Winter Meeting a couple days ago, and uh, tell you a little bit about what I saw on the HR Expo floor. So, uh, first off, to start off with uh, a little housekeeping, uh, audio might sound a little bit different today. I'm doing this from uh, my hotel room, so it might echo a little bit. And uh, but uh, and then I have a head cold to, to boot. So uh, if I sound a little bit stuffy, please forgive me and indulge me for this one episode. Anyway, the futurist that spoke, uh, David Zack was his name, brought up a couple interesting points uh, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, the first one was uh, kind of a technology, a future technology uh, that they're using today. This is the technology of lithography. If you don't know what lithography is, it's more or less, if you can imagine a printer printing sheets of paper, uh, clear sheets of paper. The ink is uh, really what makes up the, the physical object. So if you keep layering these sheets of paper over and over again, they're clear sheets of paper, but only the ink is, is really solid. And you can take a look at the object that the ink forms layer after layer. So this two-dimensional object eventually stacks up to become a three-dimensional object, and that's kind of what lithography is. It goes layer by layer and kind of reconstructs an object. So in the future, you well, actually now, you can start to make devices, uh, simple devices, that uh, are, you know, printable, essentially. Uh, in fact, I should say that, you know, simple devices is, uh, well, that's a relative term. Right now, I think that they are uh, currently developing uh, processes for uh, making, you know, printing TV screens. And also, uh, I think they are pretty close, if not in, and I'm, I'm pretty sure in both of these cases, they're in the, uh, the, the testing phase. They, get, they got them in R&D. And also for, uh, for solar cells. So that makes a huge difference in what we're talking about as far as building energy goes and uh, being able to bring down that cost uh, to install solar cells and, and, and get that payback down to a reasonable level where everybody is, is, uh, is doing it. In addition to that, um, if you, if you take this one step further, and and this kind of kind of goes out a little little bit, this is this is where the future of lithography or printing uh, actual things gets a little bit interesting. If you take it one step further and say, okay, well, I'm manufacturing TV screens and and and, and photovoltaic cells. Um, you know what what's what's stopping us from you know manufacturing spare parts that we don't have to transport you know across the country you know i see that as kind of like the green nirvana you know with the green requirements they like to keep everything local within 500 miles to to you know cut down on transportation costs but can you imagine that you could get every imaginable spare part in your hometown where you are it didn't. It didn't matter what it was. If you had, if you had the the uh, code to actually be able to replicate this uh, and and get that part, that widget, that one of a kind, that knockoff, what what have you, for a reasonable price, you know that would that would be the be all end all. And as as one of the slides that he showed was uh, one of a um, <clears throat> a a machine that actually made food. And I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, you take this, take this step, and you you, you apply it to what we've seen on in the movies and on the TV. And if you're familiar with the Star Trek uh, series, you know that there's this thing called the replicator, or the food, you know, the food replicator. And that's exactly what he was talking about. You know, here we have something that's creating something out of nothing, and as long as it knows what it's making, boom, it just made it. 
So it's, it's amazing when you think about all the things growing up that you've seen in movies and science fiction that a lot of these things are coming to pass. It may not be the, the swirling lights or whatever, but it's still the same thing. You're making, you're printing food, essentially. Um, so that was, that was a really fascinating. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm ready to eat that yet or not, but um, he also made the, made the step that, you know, once you could print food, you know, what's the next step? Printing organs. So you could really, you know, I mean, it gets crazy because personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, yeah, I wouldn't say I would never, but I severely doubt technology. I, I don't, I, I wouldn't trust that to, uh, you know, replace an arm or, um, you know, a heart or anything like that. Anyway, going on, uh, another one uh, topic that he mentioned was virtual building. And he had this example, um, and I'll post this link so you don't have to remember it, but this uh, visual effects artist made this great nine-minute short uh, film um, that it, it's, it's really not, you know, the whole thing is not about uh, building per se, but, you know, he, he, if you take a look at it, you kind of understand what I'm talking about. Um, but he's using kind of like the, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Minority Report, he's using that kind of virtual technology where he's using his hands to manipulate manipulate the air and a, and a glowing uh, 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 control panel type device. And he's, 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 he's creating this environment, um, you know, from, from nothing. And really, I think that uh, one thing that I liken that to is, is the first when I looked at that, I'm like, oh, you know, that, I mean, that would be a great way to kind of make a building. I mean, could you imagine, you know, instead of an architect um, in BIM using building information modeling, designing a building on a piece of paper, if they were actually to be in a virtual room, say, you know, wear a headset, be in a virtual room and kind of construct it, you know, real scale, you know, relative to them, relative to their, their perspective in, in this virtual world, and to be able to scale the building and to be able to manipulate it and draw it, you know, right there in front of their face. And then I apply it to, to what we're talking about, um, to be able to actually uh, engineer systems inside that building to actually kind of put it up before you install it in reality and see how that, you know, how that interacts with the structure, how it, you know, how it interferes, you know, where the, where the conflicts lie. And the one thing that that uh, kind of brought up was this um, existing condition that exists in the, in the, in the, um, engineering construction world. And some of you may be aware of this, some of you might may not be aware of this, but an engineer draws a drawing. And that might seem a little bit but a little bit too simple simplified for you, but he draws a drawing, it's schematic in nature. Um, what he does with that drawing, he gives it, you know, he, he puts it in the bid set, he gives it out to the contractor, the contractor looks at it and goes, oh this is very nice, but it, it, I can't use it. So he has, the, the contractor actually has to give it to his detailer, and the detailer would go, okay, here's the, here's the lengths of ductwork I need so they can actually manufacture the different pieces, parts, that go into making a, uh, a ductwork system or a piping system, you know, or you know, ordering you know, the different, uh, different equipment uh, and, and installing it, but they have to know the right size. I imagine a time in the future when uh, you have what you know what I what I'm kind of referring to as a a drafter detailer, somebody who is I don't know if he's a middleman and and this doesn't necessarily apply to design build but somebody who's a middleman that draws in BIM, you know using building information modeling draws it so that you can actually build off of that, and it's it's the difficulty there is having the contractor trust them because 
you know, from my standpoint as an engineer, you really have to get uh, a, a lot of buy-in. There's a lot of trust issues. And for, for very good reason, you, a lot of the engineers really don't have the details or the, they'll draw something that's really funky. It, it really takes a lot of knowledge of the, of the detailer to be able to understand what they could actually put in, what they could actually make, um, what dimensions actually work. And engineers don't necessarily always have that information. They kind of know the numbers, um, but when it comes to the actual fitting in, that's that's a that's a skill that's learned uh, over time, and that's that's not necessarily always taught. Um, so you'd have to have this very good line of of uh, trust between the engineer and the contractor. Or you know maybe it's a, just a verified third party. I don't. Maybe that's a, a separate you know profession altogether. Is this detailer drafter? But essentially, you could cut out the the middleman. The engineer could say, "I want this system. Here's here's kind of the the rough sketch layout." The detailer could lay it out in BIM, and the contractor goes, "Okay, I could I could verify that." And in fact, if you if you got it designed early enough, a BIM will allow you to uh, essentially do a cost estimate uh, on the early phases, so you know exactly what it would cost and you you probably could you know depending on on how this works out you could probably get a, a pretty accurate um representation of that so two freebies that uh, these kind of spurred my thought uh when i was thinking about the uh um this keynote speaker david zack um the first of which is a uh, if you've never heard of uh, TED Talks, um, these are lectures put on by TED, and TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. Uh, the, the basically TED is a small nonprofit dedicated to ideas worth sharing. That comes directly from them. Ideas worth sharing, and I, some of these are really fantastic. They get they get top notch speakers to speak at the TED Talks. Um, if you, this is this one's easy. It's you go to TED.com um, to take a look at uh, the videos of those of those speakers, and they it really is uh, quite amazing. They they have a uh, a myriad of uh, you know top notch uh, speakers. So check that out. Also, the second freebie is Audible.com, um, and this is a free book, um, and that's the title free. Uh, I don't know what the, I forget what the subtitle is, but it, free by Chris Anderson. Just just look up free in audible.com um, and, you know, check it out. Uh, it's absolutely free. I, I found it humorous that the, the, the second book, when you type in free, you'll get the top two books. You'll get the free book, which is unabridged, and then right below it, there's free, uh, the same book, but it's abridged. Uh, that costs thirteen twenty two thirteen dollars and twenty two cents u s um, now i, I don 't know why they had that i thought, I think it was kind of kind of humorous and maybe in in, in in thinking about it a little bit, maybe it was for uh, to actually pay the author a little bit to uh, um, you know for his you know donating a free book uh, online so uh, amazingly enough I, I think it, it as it might have you know sold a couple of copies um, probably not for listening but you know just for uh, the sake of it now on to the expo this is day one um, actually it's what I'm going to talk about is day one right now I'm I'm going to get on a bus here shortly and uh, check out day two so there'll be more, um, but these are th uh, three of the three of the uh, people that I, I've talked to. A couple, couple interesting ideas, couple you know, or uh, and, and and one uh, kind of down to earth. But let me just talk about it. Um, first one is Onicon, and uh, talking with these these are flow and energy uh, metering people. Uh, these are devices that you can you can insert into into piping to be actually determine flow rate to determine BTUs um, and uh, and the and the such. Um, the couple things that I found interesting in, in talking with uh, Bowen at Onicon was that uh, the the cataloged accuracy and I never really um, got this, but the cataloged accuracy is of a f uh, metering device. Typically, uh, and he was showing me a graph. Typically, is is set to um, thirty feet per minute. 
or 30 feet per second, rather, sorry, 30 feet per second. And if you know anything about engineering, you know that a typical HVAC system is designed for around four to eight. Now, I don't know if this is kind of, you know, meant to, you know, apply to industrial applications where you have the process piping, which is going a lot faster. Um, but for typical HVAC systems, they just have this one standard that, that, that covers everything. So the problem is, is that everybody can maintain that real tight accuracy at 30 feet per second. But when you slow it down, all of a sudden, some of the other manufacturers that, that are, you know, obviously cheaper, and you've probably figured that out, obviously cheaper than Onicon, is, um, you know, it could be as wide as 10% off on their measurement when you get down to the, to the 4 to 8 feet per second range. So I think that's really significant. So just to kind of tip, uh, you know, to send it out there to make sure that you, when you're specifying these flow metering devices, take a look at the accuracy at the actual design velocities. So don't necessarily, you know, trust this 30 feet per second. It, it could, you know, give you, you know, considerable, um, you know, uh, uh, deviations from what you're, what you're expecting. It could cause a lot of headaches. Another thing about the Onicon, uh, and this probably applies to uh, a number of other ones, but I found it interesting. The devices that we're talking about were hot tappable, and if you don't know what hot tappable means, is that they can actually be installed in piping that is active. There's water flowing through it, uh, glycol, whatever, um, and you can actually, you know, put a, a, a have a well to let, um, put that on top be able to install a valve, open it up, and then use a hot tapping machine to drill, you know, to core drill into the pipe, pull the plug out, shut the valve, and then now you can install the, the metering device on top of it. What I, what I like, um, there was two different varieties, the standard wheel variety and a magnetic variety that they had at the expo. And these are devices that the wheels, it was interesting because wheels to me, wheels in a, a, a fluid stream just seem like, you know, an accident waiting to happen. Eventually something's going to break. He reassured me that they were relatively durable um, uh, and could last a number of years. But the one nice thing I liked about it was that you can actually pull the wheels out of the, um, the flow of the pipe, shut the valve, and there's a little reservoir on top when you pull it out that the wheels kind of fit into. So it's above the valve. You could actually, you know, unscrew it, take a look at the wheels, and then, you know, change it out or just put it back in and then open the valve, drop it back down into the pipe. So that I thought was, it was, it was very interesting. The other one was the magnetic. Um, this is for a little bit more robust, um, you know, uh, systems. Uh, if there's more, you know, debris or sediment or things flying around, um, the magnetic uh, variety is, and both of these apply to, to fluid systems, not, not steam. Um, that's a different technology altogether. But the um, magnetic one um, was very interesting. As I was talking to him, um, I, one of the maintenance people from the University of Florida came up and, you know, was talking about how, you know, he had installed these magnetic uh, flow meters uh, all around his campus and that, that he was very pleased with them. So uh, check them out uh, if you need flow metering uh, or uh, energy metering, metering uh, devices. And if nothing else, uh, they should be a wealth of information. The next one is a, a Cypress Enviro Systems, and they were an AHR Award, uh, Innovation Award winner. What I found interesting about uh, the Cypress, uh, Cypress was that uh, they had a pneumatic retrofit thermostat. Now, in a lot of applications, I, I've, I've seen a lot of schools, and a, and a pneumatic retrofit thermostat, not a big surprise, but then it's, you discover that it's wireless. I'm like, oh, really? So it's wireless, and it actually communicates back to the BAS. Okay, well, you know, now you can retrofit, you know, the unit vents, uh, all those pneumatic stats with, you know, okay, that's nice. Um, still not a not a not a great selling, you know, yeah, it's a pretty good selling feature. Uh, it reports uh, the static or it reports the line pressure 
back to the BAS. That's one of its features, and that that one I think is really phenomenal, um, and very useful, especially when you're tr- troubleshooting. Because the one thing in, in pneumatic systems, when they're that old, they tend not to be well maintained. And uh, if you were, do a retrofit, and all of a sudden you're like, well, this zone doesn't work, and we just retrofitted it. Why? Well, the line pressure. There is no line pressure, so you know that there's a clog somewhere in the system. So, really, I, I think that's a, a great thing um, to be able to do to, to retrofit. It's done easily. Uh, I think that the one thing that I wasn't so, you know, I would, I would be all gung-ho, gung-ho about it um, if, if they had one more feature that I'll talk about in a second. But I think that if you have an application where you're, you have, you know, pneumatic uh, VAV boxes and, and, and controllers and things like that on your um, um, VAV system or VVT system, I think this might be a, a great application for you to uh, take this and to retrofit that so you can get a little bit more information about what's happening down at the zone level. The one thing I didn't necessarily like about it and you couldn't, um, was that it's, it's kind of, in, in my mind, when I'm dealing with schools, half of a solution um, to a really uh, a bigger problem because what we have in, in, in a lot of the schools, they'll have the the uh, heating and ventilating unit against the wall, and we're talking about Ohio here. So they'll have a heating and ventilating unit uh, against the wall, and then they at some time uh, in the in you know when they decided, hey, you know what, we should probably have air conditioning in these classrooms. Um, they slap a split system up on the wall, and that's controlled by a separate digital thermostat. Well. As you can well imagine, there's no communication between the two de- two devices, so you could potentially have them um, working against each other. Now, the one so there was no way, and, and I guess there was no way to integrate another device into the control here. Um, but you may be able to, depending on how these are circuited, you may be able to lock out the cooling devices when, you know, during heating season and then, you know, just maybe lock out the, the heating valves um, during cooling season so you can just get the ventilation out of the, uh, from the uh, heating and ventilating units. So it, it may be a possible solution. Anyway, look, uh, if, it, if it applies to you, check them out. I think that they're, uh, um, you know, they look, they look good to me. I, I, I'd have to actually check, you know, what I, would, what I would recommend is that, you know, before using them, actually finding a location where they've been used and checking with the maintenance staff and seeing exactly, you know, if they're happy with them, do they see a lot of problems with them. Um, and I would just kind of, uh, you know, do your due diligence on, on, on checking that out. Lastly, I'm going to talk about Spruce Environmental Systems. Now, you're asking me, what, what does Spruce Environmental Systems make? Well, they make uh, booster fans. And what booster fans are, if you don't, if you're not quite sure, booster fans are inline fans. They're, they're round, um, and they basically uh, help boost air. Uh, they used in radon systems or you know possibly attic ventilating systems or other other different systems like that um, they 're used in dryers and uh, um, that 's kind of why I, I stopped and talked to them so even though it may be nothing new to you there 's a couple of things that that have always been puzzling about these fans that and, and especially in a particular project that i 'm working on now um, they 're having so Let's talk about these booster fans in direct relation to uh, a particular application, say a dryer. So a couple of things that you want to remember on the dryer, and here's your, your quick tips for the, for the, the podcast. When you make sure, first of all, when you specify the fan, specif- make sure that it's specified uh, that uh, it's rated for dryer use. So you don't want a you don't want a, a fan that's that's not rated for dryer use, it, you know it could cause some problems down the road. Uh, they make you know they make these fans specifically for dryers, so make sure you get the right one. Um, second of all, and this is probably where most of the most of the problems come in, people don't necessarily know how to control them. Um, engineers usually in a situation. Uh, uh, you might find yourself in is laying out a, laying out a a dryer in the middle of a building and, and I'm talking commercial application here and the run of uh, ductwork for the exhaust is uh, exceeds the manufacturer's allowances so what do you do uh, in in that uh, you put one of these booster fans in to kind of make sure that it gets out of the building 
Now, a couple of problems with that is that uh, usually it's kind of an afterthought, so it's just kind of slapped in there. Not a, people, not a lot of thought goes into these things. Um, and the problem there is that if you do that, you typically overlook the fact that um, it needs some sort of control. A lot of engineers will just say, well, interlock it with a dryer so that when the dryer goes on, it goes on. Well, that's easier uh, done than said, or either it's easier said than done, rather. And uh, what they recommended is you use a, uh, a pressure switch. Um, insert a pressure switch uh, relatively close to the dryer, have that interlock with a fan so when the, the dryer goes on, pressure switch makes and trips the, uh, the fan to go on. Uh, now, you've got to make sure that uh, uh, on, a, on the maintenance side, you might want to you might want to clean these on an annual basis. So when you're installing them or designing them, make sure that they can actually get to them, uh, and make sure that they can you know realistically uh, and easily remove the inlet and outlet of these fans um, to make sure that they can just get in there and vacuum whatever they need to uh, for regular maintenance. Another thing is uh, make sure that there's enough distance between the dryer and the fan. Um, this is important for a couple of reasons. A, if you're, if you're, if the reason that you put it in is because you have a long duct run, these fans tend uh, to have a uh, a low tolerance for high static pressure, which means that really they like to pull air. They don't like to push air. Um, so put it as close, put it close to the outlet. Is, is kind of the, the, the rule of thumb here. Put it close to the outlet, and that's going to serve to better uh, alleviate the, um, any problems with static pressure on the discharge, discharge side. And also, if you put it too close to the uh, dryer, you may end up tripping the thermal overload, uh, and you're like, well, you know, why does the system keep shutting down? Um, it may be because it's getting too hot. It's getting all the heat uh, from the dry, dryer and not being able to, uh, to handle it. So... Those are the tips for the day. Um, I'm going to get on the bus now and go to day two of the HR Expo. So until next time, remember to know what you build and share what you know. Ah!